Holly and the others in the team have been working with us in refining our approach because they're obviously much more keyed into the particular materials that um, are being used in the projects that they manage. And so um, do feel free to um, address follow-up questions to Holly um, afterwards because she has been thinking about how this will apply to your projects. And Annabelle and I are also willing to provide any further support that's needed as well afterwards if that's helpful. So just to make sure we all know what we're talking about to start with, I thought it would be helpful to put up this definition of an archive from the International Council of Archives. So archives are the documentary byproduct of human activity retained for their long-term value. They're contemporary records created by individuals and organizations as they go about their business and therefore provide a direct window on past events. They can come in a wide range of formats, including written, photographic, moving image, sound, digital, and analog. Archives are held by public and private institutions and individuals around the world. So you can see that the emphasis is on original records that are contemporary to the period that you're looking at, but that they might come in lots of different formats. So examples that you'll probably be familiar with might be the Journal of a Convention, or letters exchanged between two members of the convention. But we also use this term archives more loosely to refer to the physical location where the archives are held. So um, you might hear someone saying, I'm going to the archives if they're going to visit the Library of Congress or the National Archives of Ireland, for example. So that's an archive. So the follow on question then is what's a resource collection? Resource collections are curated digital collections of archival material related to the projects we're modeling in Quill. I want to especially emphasize curated here because our collections are selections of material. The degree of curation is going to vary a bit from collection to collection. So just to give you an example, um, Quill has partnered with Bowdoin College in Maine to create a resource collection of Senator George Mitchell's papers. Bowdoin has a large volume of material related to his long career in the Senate and US politics, but we are only interested in what archivists would call a sub or a subset of his papers, the papers that relate to his role in the peace process in Ireland. But even within that sub we've not been able to digitize everything because of copyright restrictions and personal data restrictions and so on. So what's going to be published on Quill in the end is an edited collection of material that we consider to be useful in interpreting his role in the process and which we are legally allowed to reproduce. Um, it's important that we present this selection of curated material in a way that makes it clear to users that it is a curated selection, but also provides some context and information about its wider relation to the archive. But those are the kind of considerations that we're going to be thinking about today. Now, there are two main types of resource collection in Quill. In one, the image of the archival material we're displaying is hosted directly in Quill, like in the example you can see on the screen. But if we do not have the rights to the image, it may also be that we would just display a link to an image hosted elsewhere. We can use the technology behind the resource collection feature in Quill in other ways. Um, I don't think we'll have time to touch on that today. So we're just gonna be mainly focusing on the idea of resource collections of primary source material related to the negotiations. So depending on your particular project, the question you may be asking now is whether you need resource collections at all. If the material you're using is already online somewhere, can't we just piggyback that material? First of all, we can and do piggyback other online collections. However, where possible, we want to house as many of our collections in Quill as we can. And even when we are piggybacking another collection, we want to create a resource collection of links. Incidentally, this is something that we've been doing since the earliest 1787 projects in Quill, so it's not a new idea. It's just we've been putting more thought into making those collections do more for us recently. So there are a number of reasons why it's important to have the resource collections in Quill. First of all, it enables better research. So Quill models are based on primary source material. All that material should be in Quill. We want to make it as easy as possible for users to check our interpretations and modeling while staying on the Quill site. So you'll know yourself that if you're reading an academic book or an article, the footnotes are often really annoying to chase up and track down. So we want to offer users a tool for research that makes it really easy for them to check out the primary source materials and to um, 
test our conclusions as they go. So if I'm in um, this particular committee session, then I should be able to just click in the resource collection links at the bottom, and that'll take me straight to see the primary source material somewhere else in Quill. And similarly, if I'm just looking for this primary source material and I discover that first, I can click and end up in the model and see the other great research that's going on. So it enables better research. Secondly, it also enables better resources. So good resource collections mean that we have more data about the primary sources in the database, and therefore lots more options for exploiting them and creating other tools for, re for researchers and users. So we can create commentary collections and the transcriptions are searchable. So the search brings up more results for people. You can order material by dates and authors. And particularly nicely, you can attach resource items to multiple negotiations. So that will help us to highlight the connections between different projects better, which could start to generate some interesting networks in the state constitution projects. We're also talking to AI experts about other ways we can exploit these collections in the future, if we can get more funding to do that. So basically there are lots of possibilities, but it does depend on having the resources and the metadata around them accurately entered in the database. Then the next reason why we want to focus on resource collections is that they definitely generate more users for Quill. All our user research shows that users love the convenience of having primary sources in one place and projects with well-developed resource collections attract a lot more users. So researchers clearly feel the need for these primary sources and it draws them into Quill if they're easy to use and um, well um, listed and catalogued. But we aren't just benefiting other people. It makes it easier for us and easier for you as well. So as you know, there are lots of checks that take place in the data entry in the models. So if Cashlin or Holly or someone else is checking your work, it's going to be a lot easier for them if they can immediately see in Quill the resource item you've relied on for the session you're working on, rather than having to go and hunt that down in, um, and somewhere else in a computer system. It's also easier for you. So if you've had a break and you come back to the session, you can pick up where you left and the resource items just there waiting for you. So if you start by creating the resource collections, the transcriptions will be available for you as well when you start to model. And that gets rid of the problems of copying, do, copying text from Word into the document field in the data entry section, which can kind of cause havoc the do, document text sometimes. So for this reason, we want to encourage you to start with the primary sources and the resource collections when you start a new project and to get into the habit of making attaching those sources to the session the first thing you do. I've now got um, a short video for you that's going to take you on a tour of the resource collections and how to attach items to them. Thanks. We're starting on the Quill library page, which should be familiar to you all. This is one place where your resource collection will appear once your lead editor has created it for you. So, for example, if I scroll down past the resource collections tab here, this is one of the resource collections that we've created for the Writing Peace Project on Northern Ireland. It includes a range of documents from the National Archives of the UK. However, there is also an easier way to find the resource collections you'll be working with on a day-to-day -day basis. If you go to the full record view of the negotiation that you're working on and scroll down past the source material, delegations and committees, you can view the resource collections associated with the negotiation and click through that way. If your resource collection has not yet been associated and does not appear here, you can use the edit menu to attach the resource collection to the negotiation. When you click view collection, you will be taken to a page where you can see a series of boxes, which might be organized into different categories. Think of this as if you were in the archive. There will be a lot of boxes full of documents, all of which have unique identifying numbers or names and which might be grouped together into different structures. You can click view box items to open the box and see all the documents inside it. Once you click on an item, you will be taken to this page where you are viewing a resource item directly. 
This is the name we give to your archival scan once it is uploaded to Quill with all of its associated metadata. The resource item will have a unique identifying number and jump code, just like all the events, sessions, committees and negotiations in Quill. You can find that here. On the left hand side, you can scroll down through the items in the box you currently have open and use the navigation tools to view lists of documents in other boxes or to open those other boxes to view and explore those items. There are also other tools that researchers can use to explore and compare different documents, tools which are currently under further development. For example, if you wanted to compare this draft of the joint declaration to a later version, in, also in the box, you could find that by searching titles within the box, or you could click split view to see the two documents side by side. On the right hand side, you can see a list of all the sessions that this document has been used to model. Clicking on one of the links will take you to that session. Part of your job as student editors will be creating these associations as you model to help researchers find the source material they need and understand how it relates to the model. To link a resource item to a particular session, open the edit menu in the top right hand corner, click attach this item to session and then select the negotiation and the session ID that you want to attach the item to. You can also type in the number here. The digital nature of the archive collection opens up further new opportunities. If we go back to the landing page of the resource collection, for example, and then click show all items, we are able to search the titles of all the items within the correction while still seeing which box they belong to and what position they have within it via these little metadata tags. This is what you'll be helping to create. Okay, I'm sorry if that was a bit quiet for you. We can share the video with you directly afterwards, but hopefully clicking through um, the site was interesting. So now that we've established what a resource collection is, the question is how we can go about gathering material to create one. So the starting point for this will vary from project to project. So you might be cataloging a donated archive from scratch, um, as you can see in the picture, and um, going on to create a digital resource collection. We're not going to address that here. If that happens, we'd recommend that you hire an ar archivist to help to oversee the process. The second two types of collection, which you almost certainly will encounter, is either you'll be scanning files which have already been catalogued and housed in another archive, so somewhere like the Library of Congress, or you'll be working from an archive that's already been digitized. So we're going to start with walking you through the process of collecting the files yourself in an archive. Hopefully some of you will be doing that, but even if you don't, it highlights a process that has already taken place in the online collections that you do access and that you need to be aware of as you build the resource collections using the digitized material. So whatever kind of collection you're building, there are three core archival principles that we need to adhere to. The first is called respect des fonds. It's a French word, which just means respect for the sources of the material. Second one is provenance. And the third is original order. We're not going to go into archival theory and practice here, but we do want to highlight the key implications for our digital collections. So the first is that records from different archival collections should not be mixed. And conversely, all the files from one archive should be in one resource collection. So as many of you know, our office here is associated with Tolkien. So if you know anything about Lord of the Rings, Imagine you want to model the Council of Elrond and you've collected materials from three different archives. The official Rivendell archive containing paper from the elves, the Bilbo Baggins archive of Middle-earth that contains the Hobbit's papers and Aragorn's royal collection. 
you don't start in Quill by creating a Council of Elrond collection and mixing together the archives of the hobbits, the elves, and the men. You need to create a different collection for each of the archives you visited. So you have three different resource collections in your Council of Elrond negotiation. Now, I suppose this same Rivendell archive has both Elrond's papers and a collection of Legolas's papers, so two sets of elves' papers. This will still be one resource collection in Quill because they've come from the same archive, but you will need to have two separate boxes to separate the papers of Elrond and Legolas. So you could think of the resource collection as the building where the archives are housed, which has a sign in the door telling you which archive you've just arrived at. Once you get inside, they're gonna be separate rooms for Elrond and Legolas. Inside their rooms, there are cupboards, and inside those cupboards, there might be files, and inside those files, documents, however many levels you need. So that's the first thing. We need to um, ensure that records from different archival collections are not mixed, and that all the files from one archive are in the same collection. Then secondly, we need to structure our collection so that the user knows exactly where a document has come from. So if they want to go and see the original document, they should know exactly where they need to go and what they need to call up from the archive. This means we have to think carefully about what we call our boxes and ensure that we record the information accurately in the metadata. Then thirdly, the hierarchy within the original archive has to be maintained. If you have boxes within boxes, the user should be able to understand the context of the particular document they're looking at in the wider collection and draw conclusions about what it was co-located with. And finally, supplementary and contextual information about the document should be available to our end user. So basically, we want to replicate as closely as possible the experience of visiting the archive and seeing the document in the physical archive box. These principles need to be consciously and intentionally adhered to in all the collections we create, whether they're based in online material or sources that we've gathered ourselves. The application is going to be slightly different in each case, but the core principles are the same. It also means it's really worth investing quite a bit of time at the beginning of a project, thinking about how you map the physical archive and the online collection. Once you've worked out the relationship of the two, we're going to make it easier for you by creating bespoke upload forms with drop-down lists for each project so that students uploading material have limited options and can create accurate metadata. More on that later. So the next couple of screens, I'm sorry, are a bit text intensive and I'm gonna whiz through them quite quickly, but we just wanted to make sure that you have a checklist to go back to um, if you're going to visit an archive and collect material. I think most of this is probably blindingly obvious when you think about it, but it's helpful to have it written down because I know that we've made some of these mistakes ourselves. So um, we're, we're not, um, it's not like we're immune to making mistakes on it. Um, so a good resource collection has to begin with careful planning and assembling of the resources. And here are some practical reminders for going to the archive. So first of all, make sure you do your background research in the archive. Does the archive from which you're trying to source material have a policy on publishing images from their collection? Do they need to be informed about your visit? So this is probably primarily a responsibility of the PI and similar, senior editor, but there's no harm in anybody else asking the question of those people. Uh, check the catalogue, create a list of the files, documents and boxes that you hope to look at, arrange a team meeting to assign files to team members, etc. And prioritise the files you want to look at and have backups. It's often hard to predict what you're going to find until you get there. So I would recommend that you have some extra files that you can call up if you get through things quicker than you expected and make sure that you look, you know which ones are going to be most important and try to look at them first. Training, some archives require you to conduct online training before you visit. So make sure you read information from the archive about preparing for your visit as local practice will vary. Just because you visited one archive doesn't mean it'll be the same practice at the next one. Equipment, if a scanner is not available to you, download a good quality scanning app. Don't rely on photographs from your phone's camera and practice using the app in advance. Um, in the office, we tend to use Microsoft Lens because it connects to our university's OneDrive so we can take pictures, um, export them as PDFs and they get immediately stored in the university system. Um, which brings me to storage. So 
how are you going to store the images that you take? Can you directly outsource them to the cloud or do you need to have a hard drive with you? And then the really obvious, make sure that you have chargers and cables. And if you're the team lead, assume nothing from the people that you're bringing and bring extra chargers and cables for them too. Then um, we talked about the core principles. So think carefully about these, how these apply when you're um, conducting your visit. So when you leave the archive, you're going to need to know exactly where every scan came from, and you should not rely on your memory for this. You might think you've got a good memory, but when you come back to look at them three days later, you won't remember where things came from. So before you start scanning, create folders in your file share or hard drive that match the exact names of the documents, files, and boxes in the catalog of the archive that you're going to consult. And ideally upload your files here as you scan. If you're using Microsoft Lens, you should be able to do that directly to the University OneDrive. Your digital file hierarchy should match exactly the hierarchy used by the archive you're visiting. There's just a little example there. Okay, so you've got to the archive. Exactly what happens next will depend a little bit on the arrangement in this particular archive, but let's assume you have boxes with folders inside. Scan each folder as a single file with the cover of the folder as the first page would be what we recommend. If you prefer to save as separate documents at this point, so every set of minutes as a different document, you can do that. But personally, I think that's a bit slower as you have to name and number each document individually to ensure they're kept in the right order. Um, I think it's better to maximize the time in the archive and split the documents later when you're preparing the spreadsheet of files to upload. In terms of how much to scan, it does depend a bit on the nature of the project and the time available. Um, I would err on the side of more, not less, because sometimes you don't know until later what's going to be important. If most of a folder seems relevant, it's often quicker to scan the whole folder than to take the time to read carefully and make a judgment. It isn't always easy to tell at a glance if you're looking at duplicates of a document, for example, or drafts with just minor changes each time. Obviously, if it's the latter, it's important to us to have both copies in Quill, but you might only be able to tell with close reading of the text. If the folder is too big to scan as one document, make sure you number the files to maintain the original order. And a very quick practical thing, in terms of what you export from the scanning process, the minimum requirement would be a readable PDF. Best practice would be to have a PDF, a JPEG or a TIFF, and a first pass OCR Word file. If you're scanning on site in an archive, and especially if you've only got a mobile phone with a scanning app, then we'd suggest that you just export to PDF as that's acceptable and we can generate the other forms later. If you have time and have access to an overhead scanner, then it's often quite quick and easy to export everything at the same time. So to sum up, when you leave the archive, you should have your scans saved in a folder, folders that mirror the physical collections Anyone coming along should be able to identify exactly where each document came from. If you didn't go back to the office, could someone else pick up from where you left off without any difficulty? So that's what happens when you visit a physical collection. But suppose you don't need to fly to Washington DC or get the train to London because all the documents you have have been wonderfully digitized by someone else. In some ways, that's a godsend. It saves lots of money for projects, something close to my heart and to Scott's in our roles, and it saves time and effort transporting people around the country to scan boxes of documents. However, it's not a get out of jail free card if you have that expression in the US too. How useful and easy to use these collections are, are going to depend on how well the core principles were applied when those collections, collections were created. You save work in some areas, but you've different research to undertake before you can incorporate them into Quill. So there's two key questions that you need to ask when using online collections. You do have to ask them about other materials you've scanned yourself, but by and large, that situation is a lot clearer when you're working with physical archives and have to deal with real live archivists. So the first question is, is this a primary source or a secondary source? As you probably know from your own studies, this is a key consideration for researchers. If we want the modeling we're doing on Quill to be authoritative, then we need to go back to the original source or as close to it as we can possibly get. The secondary source will definitely help us to get there, 
but we want to build the model on the foundational documents and we want to provide those documents as evidence in our resource collections. So how do I know what I'm looking at? Am I seeing an image of a manuscript of some kind? So you can have a look here. Or am I seeing a transcription with annotations and perhaps a citation with information about where it's come from that would help me identify what I'm looking at? Now, don't get me wrong, secondary sources are great too. Annabelle and I just had a conversation with Nicholas the other day on how we can better acknowledge secondary sources and Quill as we go along. And as a minimum, it would be great if the team leads can make sure they keep a list of secondary sources that are consulted so we can create a bibliography for each convention at the end. So I don't want you to go away from today saying that they told us not to use edited volumes because they're secondary sources. We should certainly use them. We stand on the shoulders of giants in some cases, and we should cite them and give full reference in the editor's notes if we rely on them. But we should also test them and make sure we compare what they have with the primary text themselves. Annabelle and I have definitely found errors in the secondary literature and oral history collections by going back to the archival documents. So when it comes to building the document text in your model, amendments to the text should be relying on a contemporary source, not a secondary source that's been edited by someone else. If you can't get back to a primary source, then you need to raise that as a concern so a conversation can take place around what the team does with that and how they proceed. Now, I'm not an expert in finding area America, but Dr. Cole has assured us that for the projects that you're working on, it should be possible to go back to primary sources for all the key textual changes in the documents you're modeling. If you've made a genuine effort to find a primary source and then you can't, do let Holly know and we'll hassle Dr. Cole and see what we can do. <laughs> but honestly, that detective work, trying to piece together the evidence and find the source for material for it, is part of the fun of research, so we just need to embrace it as well. So that's question one. You find a primary source, perhaps it's the journal of the meeting or someone's diary. The second question is whether you're allowed to reproduce the image or text that you find online. So question one, does it say anything on the site to indicate that you are? It might be very clear, like this little box from the Library of Congress, which provides information and policies to click through and check. Question two, is it behind a paywall? In which case the answer is probably no. <laughs> Incidentally, just because you can see and download an item doesn't mean that anyone else will be able to see and download it. And it doesn't mean you're allowed to use it on another website. So um, just the other day, one of us clicked through and opened a document because we happened to be signed into our, the Oxford University Library system. Someone else in the office clicked the same link and couldn't get into the document. If that hadn't happened, it wouldn't have been obvious to the first person that they'd been automatically signed in by their computer. So just do be careful with that and um, check that out. Have you been signed into something? And that's why you can see it. Then the next question is, uh, can I see the primary source and make my own transcription? So copyright is another good reason why it's good to go back to the primary sources as they are much less likely to be copyrighted, especially for you guys if you're working on 18th and 19th century projects. If you've got back far enough to be looking at a picture of a manuscript, like the one on one side of the screen here, then um, you are, will be allowed to make your own transcription and use that in your projects. For the purpose of the 18th and 19th century projects, if you can see original documents, my understanding is that you're allowed to transcribe it and quote it as the text itself is no longer subject to copyright. However, the image itself may be copyrighted and the archive may have retained the rights to its use. If this is the case, then think about whether it's worth contacting the archive or whether you will have to display a link to the image rather than the image itself. Hopefully there'll be some guidance in the site you're using about whether you can use the images or not. Sometimes it's clearly stated um, and in which case you're good to go, but just make sure that you fully and prominently acknowledge the site that you were using. If there's any doubt, or if you're going to be using a lot of material, it would definitely be worth getting hold of the owners of the archive to discuss what your whether your requirements would be considered fair use and to ask them how they would like to be acknowledged. We can brand resource collections with other logos and colors. So do feel free to offer that option if you're working with somebody and using a lot of materials from one online site. Um, so this just shows you how we can um, display a link to a collection 
rather than displaying the item. So this is the same item from an online collection that we have permission to use, and we can show it with either the link or we can show the image of the document. So to sum up, even if you're creating a collection using online material, consider the core principles of respect de fond, provenance and original order and how you structure your collections. You're mapping your collections to another online collection, but similar principles apply to matching it to a physical archive. One box per site, don't mix different archives, etc. Enter the various metadata fields just as you would for a physical item so that Quill can go on to generate all the links between sources that it would with the standard resource collection and attach the resource items to the sessions in your model as you would with the standard resource item. That's enough from me. Annabelle's going to take you through some of the nitty gritty of capturing the metadata for the resource collections now. Can you all see my screen? Great. So I'm now going to talk you through the next phase of the process. This might happen when you get back to the office from the archive, or alternatively, once you've identified the online collections and the specific documents within them that you'll need to create as resource collections to model your negotiation. Simply put, you need to ensure that you have well-organized collections of documents, then collect and record a series of metadata and upload those documents along with their associated metadata to Quill. Why do I say documents rather than links? As Ruth has already emphasized, we think it is important that wherever possible and allowed by copyright, you do download the images of the documents in question. Even if these cannot be displayed publicly in Quill, they could be an important resource for you guys and for future documentary editors if the site the links are taken from is remodeled or taken down. However, where it is not possible to download documents, you will need an organized collection of offline links that reflect how the documents are organized within the collections you're indexing. Ask yourself whether someone who is new to the project could use your resources to build a collection without having to repeat all of your research. So the first question some of you might be asking yourselves is, what is metadata anyway? On the simplest level, metadata kind of just does what it says on the tin. It's data that we record that describes or gives us information about other data. What does that mean specifically for Quill and for us all as documentary editors? In this case, the metadata we record is a series of around 20 fields, exactly how many will depend on the project, which provide important contextual information about the documents you have scanned or located. How do we decide on these particular metadata fields? It wasn't an arbitrary decision. They're based on a set of common standards devised by the International Council on Archives, known as the ISADG, or the General Standard of Archival Description. They don't follow the ISADG word for word, since what we are doing is slightly different from the work of digital archivists indexing their own collections in parallel with the physical papers, but they do reflect the common standards set out there. This relates to our earlier point about being a big Quill community. It's important that the archivists we are trying to build relationships with see that as a whole, Quill is respectful of core archival principles and has thought about how to apply them to our own collections even if we are not archives in the conventional or traditional sense. So how do we use the metadata? Firstly and most importantly, we use the metadata to ensure that we're respecting the core archival principles that Ruth spoke about earlier. So just to remind you all again quickly, these are Rosby de Fonds, provenance and original order. Provenance and original order are particularly important here. The metadata that you record will give us a detailed picture of where exactly the document was when you found it in the archive and will allow us to then recreate that information for the end user in Quill. Secondly, we can use this metadata also to add value to the collections. There are certain advantages to a digital platform which allow us to do things with the scans that can't be done with the physical documents. Generally speaking, the three key ways in which the metadata allows us to add value are by searching the documents, filtering the documents, and resorting the documents. For example, perhaps you're a researcher and you want to look for documents from a particular month or only see items that pertain to a particular keyword. Perhaps you're a documentary editor and you want to see all of the items in the collection in chronological order to know where to start your modeling. With the resource collections, you should be able to do any of those things. However, 
It is important to emphasize that these two uses are in harmony with each other rather than in conflict. We're continuing to work on ways of maintaining users' sense of the archival hierarchy and context, whilst also helping them view the documents in different and more accessible ways. So one example of that is the little metadata tags that you saw at the end of the video earlier. So these ones here. How do we record this metadata? Or how will you record this metadata as well? So we record it in an Excel spreadsheet and in Quill via the upload item form simultaneously. You'll be sent a collaborative spreadsheet to work on by the lead editor on your project. As many of you already know, the upload form is under the edit menu on the resource collection homepage. However, as Ruth said earlier, we'll be building bespoke versions of the form for each project where the um, drop down lists and various different things are set by the senior editors. So you're probably asking yourselves, why record this data twice? Having things in two places is our gold standard because it means that if one entry is wrong, then that entry can be cross-referenced and corrected with reference to the other. Human error is pretty unavoidable, especially when you're editing a spreadsheet for hours at a time. Um, the lead editors on projects can also use the spreadsheets that you will create to mass edit metadata. Meanwhile, Quill will automatically correct a spreadsheet view of the items that you upload, which can be exported as a spreadsheet. This means that we can edit mistakes really quickly rather than going in and check, checking each item individually if there is some kind of problem with how either Quill or the spreadsheet is saving particular categories at some point in time. So before we discuss the metadata fields, I just want to make a quick point about the spreadsheet. There are two cardinal rules of spreadsheeting. They're unfortunately both very boring, but they're also very important. If you remember them, it will make your life and the lives of your colleagues and collaborators a lot easier later on. Um, they may seem obvious, but I can say from experience that they're easy to forget. So number one is make sure that all of the fields in the spreadsheet are always set to text. This is especially true for the date ones. If the data is stored as a date, that would date will open on some people's computers in an American format, on other people's computers in a UK format. Some of them will have the year as four characters, some will have it as two, some will randomly start replacing numbers with words, and it will only take this happening once to make all of the data in the column completely useless. Your collaborative spreadsheet will probably be a Google Doc, so I've got a little image of how to do that on Google Docs in case anyone needs a refresher in the top right hand corner. Rule number two is don't add spaces to the end of any of the fields. This is particularly important for the box name and for the file name. In some ways, computers are very silly. If you put a space at the end of the name of box slash folder field, Quill will assume that you wanted to create two boxes, one called box one and one called box one space. If you put a space in the file name, either in the spreadsheet or as you save the file itself, then the two will not match and the spreadsheet won't be able to be used to edit metadata. So now I'm going to take you through the metadata fields one by one. For each field, I'm going to describe what information you will use it to record, how you will record that information in Quill and in the spreadsheet, and how that metadata will appear to an end user of Quill. A lot of this is pretty simple, really, but it does mean that you'll be getting a ton of information all in one go. So apologies for that in advance. Um, we will be sending you this PowerPoint after the session to refer back to, so don't feel you have to try and write everything down or take notes. The first five metadata fields are used to organize the way that documents are presented in Quill. They assign the documents to boxes, group particular items or boxes together, and control the order that documents appear in within those boxes. This means that these fields are particularly crucial since they allow us to follow that principle of original order and replicate the hierarchy of the physical archive. They will also map onto the way that you have saved and organized your scans, images, or links. The question of how exactly your files, which will represent a subsection of this archive tree on the left, map onto the Quill metadata fields will be a question to be discussed between the UVU team leads and the lead editors on the project, so in this case, Holly. You will need to draw an archive tree for the physical or digital archive that you're working on, and then work through how that maps onto your folders as they're saved, and then onto the metadata categories in Quill. So the first field is name of box slash folder. 
This field assigns the document you are recording the metadata for to a particular box. The Quill box is the key organizing principle within Quill, within the resource collections. You saw an example of this earlier in the video. This will usually correspond to the name or identifying number of the archive box, or in some cases, archive folder, that the physical document can be found in. In the spreadsheet, you will have to in enter this information yourself, but in the Quill upload form, you will select it from a drop down list. This second metadata field, the item number, controls the order that items appear in within a particular box. As Ruth has already said, it's very important that we ensure that the documents appear in Quill in the same order within a box as they do in the physical archive or in the digital archive that you're working in. In both the spreadsheet and the Quill upload form, this will be a free text field. You will need to think like a computer. One example of this is using 01 to 09, where more than 10 documents appear in a box, or 001 to 099, where more than 100 appear. Sometimes an archive may assign item numbers to its documents. This means that if you split up your documents they consider as one item, you may have to start using things like 18A and 18B. Exact issues will vary by collection, of course, but I guess what I want to emphasize is that this can be harder than it looks and it's important to get it right. The next field is the file name. This field won't actually be visible to end users in Quill, but it is very important for us as editors nevertheless. It records the file names that you have used to save individual documents. They should be in, they should all be in the format name of box slash folder underscore item number. This is essential because it means that the document always carries its position within the physical archive with it, which makes it much harder to lose that information. If you accidentally lose metadata like the date of a document or its author, that information can be input again. But if we lose the information about what box a physical document was stored in or its position within that box, you would have to go back to the archive ultimately to check that, which probably isn't very viable. If you've come back from the archive with your scan of the whole box and its cover page, as Ruth recommended, I would suggest that you duplicate that file before you start splitting it up and renaming the individual documents. This means that you'll have the backup to check this information against, just in case. This field should populate automatically in Quill when you upload a document via the form, but you will need to make sure that the entry in the spreadsheet is exactly the same as the saved file name. And if you edit one, you must edit the other at the same time to keep them the same. Um, and check for spaces, as I said before, or weird punctuation like forward slashes that doesn't go in the box, which shouldn't be in it. So the next field, which is kind of a little um, extra one, taking it to six, is the link field. So you should populate this field, and it's very important to, if you're creating a collection with documents that you've downloaded or sourced from another digital collection. The link will display in Quill, as you can see on the slide, so down here, either instead of an image or alongside it. We need these links to be reliable. So wherever the option is available to you, you should choose a DOI or a permalink. And when sources are available on more than one site, you should consider whether they provide DRIs or permalinks as one criterion amongst many in deciding which site to use. This is especially important if you do not have permission to display the images in a collection. So whether you fill in the next two fields will depend on how the physical papers have been organized and will be decided by the lead editor in conversation with the UVU team leads. They will set a drop down for you to select from in Quill. These are further sorting and grouping fields, which allow us to help the end users better understand the hierarchy of the physical archive. This first one, category, allows us to group a series of boxes together. For example, within the archive of the elves mentioned earlier, you might find that the files of the elves from Rivendell are grouped together in one place, and the files of the elves from Lothlorien are in another, and you might need a way to represent that in Quill. This second field groups particular items together within one Quill box subdivision. Again, it's a way of representing divisions that you might find within the physical archive in Quill. For example, if you had a box that contained all of the minutes um, of the meetings of a particular committee, you might find that the minutes from January were in one smaller folder and the minutes from February were in another within that box. So just to recap, those first six fields will be mapped on to both the physical structure of the archive and the structure of your saved files. 
This means that an end user looking at a resource item in Quill will immediately know where to find the physical sheet of paper within the archive that we are collaborating with. It also means that if they had access to your file share system, they could immediately find the correct file within that without any help from you. This will also help us when we have multiple people across different teams working on the same project. I'm now going to take you through the rest of the fields. Rather than describing the physical location of the documents, as we've been doing up till now, these ones record information about the substance, contents, and provenance of each document. So, the first of these fields is the title of the document. This will be a free text field in Quill, as well as in the spreadsheet. So you will want to try and develop editorial naming conventions for this field that are specific to your resource collection. This will help ensure that different editors are titling documents in a consistent way. As you develop these conventions, you'll want to consider the needs of the end user. This field will appear to them most obviously at the top of the page for each resource item. However, more importantly perhaps, it will also appear to them in the list of documents on the left-hand side and within the box view. This means that it will help them decide whether or not to view a particular document. They will also be able to search all of the documents by title, and we found that, one of this, this, that this is one of the key ways that users navigate and sort the collections. You should think about how they will do this and what they will search for to make sure that as many documents as possible are returned by particular searches. For example, you'll want to standardize how delegates are referred to and whether or not you're using acronyms for important organizations. Dates also are something that you need to agree on how and when to include in the titles. One last thing to note is that up until now, we've used title case in the titles. However, we found this introduces quite a lot of errors and inconsistencies, and going forward, we would recommend that everybody use sentence case for this field. The next one is negotiation slash committee. In this field, you will record either the negotiation or the committee to which the document is related. You will have a drop down to select from within Quill and you will be able to select more than one option where necessary, although you should try to limit this as much as possible. The decision of whether to sort documents by committees or by negotiations will be taken for the resource collection as a whole, based on whether you're dealing with a series of documents spanning multiple negotiations or one which relates only to one negotiation. If you spot a document which doesn't seem to fit, for example, perhaps you're selecting by committee, but you found a document which relates to a completely different negotiation. Flag it to your lead editor. Document type. For this field, you'll select a document type from the drop down menu. This menu will be set by the lead editor and the team leads and will reflect the kind of documents widely encountered within the project. These types may well overlap with the document subtypes that you're already familiar with in Quill but there won't be a one-to-one -one correspondence between the two categories. You'll only be able to select one option for this field. If you are hesitating between two types, consider which option would provide more helpful information for the end user. If you are filtering the collection by category, which option would you prefer it to appear under? For example, in the National Archive collections that we use for writing piece, civil servants often address the minutes of meetings to other civil servants. We did have both correspondence and record of meeting subtypes, but these documents would clearly have been more useful to people searching for meeting records than to people searching for correspondence. So the next field is the author, and that's fairly self-explanatory. You need to tell us which individual or individuals wrote the text of the document. Where there is more than one author, you should separate them in a spreadsheet with semicolons and enter unknown if you're not sure of the author. The lead editor and the team leads will come up with a list of likely names that will appear as suggestions in the form in Quill. As they do this, they will need to decide how to standardize referring to de particular delegates. You don't want to end up with George Washington, Washington, and the president all appearing as separate authors in your resource collection. This next field records the organization that the authors in the previous field are affiliated with. This might be a government, a political party, a newspaper or a corporation of some kind. You may also need to record more than one affiliation for one person. This is a useful field for people who might be tackling broader questions in their research, tracking the influence, interventions or legislative output of particular groups rather than of specific delegates. It also avoids us mixing up individual delegates and political parties within one category. 
As with the author field, the team leads and the lead editor will need to decide on a list of the core options to avoid people referring to the same groups in different ways and to give people a standard format to follow. So our next two fields will be date fields. This one, the date of document creation, is the date field that appears below the title in Quill. It can also be used for filtering and sorting documents. You should input the date that the document was created. So if it is the minute of a meeting that happened on the 24th of February, but the minute itself was written on the 26th, put the 26th. In the Quill upload form, you will have a pop-up that lets you see the calendar and choose the date that way. However, the spreadsheet upload system is set up for UK dates. So please put the date in the UK format you can see on the slide. If you don't know the date, or if you don't know elements of the date, replace the characters that you don't know with question marks, as in the example. You can also use your editorial judgment and independent research skills to narrow down dates where they aren't explicitly given. For example, you could look up the date of a newspaper article using a corpus that you have access to through your university, or you could infer that a letter was written on the 30th of November, if they refer to a meeting on the 31st being tomorrow. I've just realised there isn't a 31st of November, so that would be the 1st of December, but you take my general point. <laughs> so our next date is the date of meeting or event or enclosure. This is a supplementary date field. We use it to record important dates that aren't necessarily the date on which the document was created. For an important meeting between two heads of state, for example, the first briefing document might be written months in advance of the meeting, but it would still be a useful document for someone researching the meeting. So in that example from before, this is where you put the date of the meeting itself. You can also use it to record the date of an enclosure or another date that is an important point of reference for the document. That being said, you can repeat the date of document, document creation here where they do coincide and you don't have another option. If someone is searching for documents relating to a particular meeting, it's helpful if they only have to search one field to get all the relevant documents and not have to use a second filter for documents that do in fact date from the day of the meeting as well. The next field is length in scan pages. This is self-explanatory. You just need to give the number of scan pages in the file. This field isn't visible to users in Quill, except insofar as they can obviously see the number of pages in your PDF but it's more of an internal audit field that allows us to check whether any digital pages have been lost in the process of cataloging. This metadata field, the length in physical sheets, probably won't be necessary very often. We only use it while we're cataloging papers as it's necessary to record the number of physical sheets of paper in a collection to preserve the papers against loss or theft. But if they're in the care of an archive, that is their responsibility rather than yours. The next field is the item description, which is relevant for all projects. So this metadata field will appear under the title in Quill. Yeah. It's a free text field where you will give a brief description of the contents and physical features of the document you're working on. You should write in full sentences rather than bullet points. You can briefly contextualize the item if necessary. For example, if you notice the third draft they're discussing, mention that, but do not give your personal assessment of the document. As a good general rule, you should never be using personal pronouns in this field, first person personal pronouns in this field. Ultimately, you should think of an item description like a catalog entry. Does your description give the end user enough information to allow them to decide whether or not to click on the link and or read the document all the way through? Those principles are all a little bit abstract. So I've included some concrete examples here of the sort of thing you should be aiming for. So I'll just give you a second to look at them. So these descriptions are written in full sentences using the correct tenses. They're fairly brief, but they still give the user important information about the contents of the document and any physical features of it. So, for example, in this case, the annotations in the second example. If a researcher was interested in a particular phase of the document's history, they would immediately know whether or not the documents were relevant to their search from reading the descriptions. And here we have some examples of things not to do. So I'll give you another few seconds to read those ones.
The first description here begins with an opinion or a personal judgment. Whilst you might, for example, note that a photocopy is very faded, it's not very scholarly to declare a handwritten note illegible. And as I said before, you should avoid using first person pronouns in this field. The writer has often has also been overly vague. So as readers, we're not actually been told that the document is a handwritten note here. And it's not clear what meeting they have in mind um, or what the British position that they refer to actually is or what that position is on even. Um, in the second example, again, we've not been told what kind of document we're dealing with. There are also some odd tensions in use here. I think we probably all know how easy it is when we're spending hours at a time with the documents to drift into the present tense. But do remember that the events happened in the past. So you might use the present tense to say something like there are annotations or this letter records, but don't tell us that Thomas Jefferson is going to ask George Washington something. Probably. The next field is the keywords field. For this field, you will select appropriate keywords from the drop down menu agreed between Holly and the team leads. These will appear in Quill under each document, as you can see on the slide, the little keys. And they will also be used to search for and filter the documents within a collection. Some documents will have many keywords associated with them, whilst others will have none or hardly any. And that's totally fine. After all, some documents are more important than others. If you find yourself using a keyword for every single document, it is probably worth asking yourself whether the keyword is too broad or whether you are using it too broadly. But then again, on the other hand, if you're cataloging a folder titled rules of order and you have a rules keyword, you might well be expecting to be using that for every document. And it would still be helpful for someone searching all of the items in the collection for things marked rules. So it's really a question of continuing to communicate amongst yourselves and with Holly to make sure that you're all using the keywords in a similar way and that you continue to feel they're useful and appropriate. If you think there's a really important one missing as you go along, you can always make a case for it to your team lead and they can raise it with Holly. This field, the copyright notes, uses a traffic light system to note the copyright status of each resource item. This is a really important field and filling it in is a good way of making sure that you are aware of the copyright status of any material you're using in the model. If something is red or amber, you will be able to use it to make inferences or to cite for particular facts, but you will not be able to use the text in the description field. Amber and red resource items will also have elements of their metadata restricted in Quill to make sure that we're not infringing on copyright. So green is used for an item where the text is not under copyright or we have secured the rights to it or it's open access or available under a Creative Commons license or similar. If 120 years have passed since the date of the document's creation, it will almost certainly be out of copyright. So that means that you're fine on quite a lot of the things in the projects that you're working on with the originals like Ruth was saying. Red, on the other hand, is used when something is definitely under copyright and we've not secured the rights to use the text. For example, this might be an index compiled by another researcher. Amber is used for situations where the copyright is uncertain. Perhaps the most common example of this you will encounter is when you take on copyrighted material from a copyrighted source. For example, if you can only find a letter by Thomas Jefferson in an edition compiled and annotated by someone else. Another example might be an edited volume which puts the journal and the debate side by side. If the selection of particular material to be compared has been done by another researcher, it isn't just as simple as knowing that it's been, it's been 120 years since the journal and debates themselves were published. If you select amber or red in the Quill upload form, you will get a text box pop up to explain why you selected that option. And this is an opportunity to flag any issues with the material for review. This field is project dependent and I don't think it will be relevant for the majority um, or possibly the totality of your projects. So GDPR is the acronym we use in the UK to refer to data protection. This field uses a traffic light system, as like the one before, to ensure that we're not publishing sensitive information or personal details, such as home addresses and personal phone numbers on Quill. Um, if 100 years have passed since everyone in the project died for anything kind of post 1900, 1920s, then there's not really any point in even thinking about whether to include this field. 
So the next field is copyright information. And the obvious first question is, how is this different from the copyright notes field? So the copyright notes is a traffic light system that restricts what metadata the end user can see. This field, the copyright information, instead displays a message to the end user, which explains the copyright status of the item to them. The message appears just under the item details on the resource item page, as you can see in the picture. So it appears alongside the image or the link. You will select this message from a drop down set by the lead editor and the team leads again. But if you think that none of the messages are appropriate for the item that you're cataloging, you should definitely flag that to them. It's a field where it's difficult to cover all eventualities in advance. Why is this field necessary? Firstly, certain kinds of license, like the open government license in this instance, but also things like Creative Commons licenses, can require that a link to the license has to be displayed alongside the material. And this is a way of allowing us to do that. Secondly, it allows us to flag something which is give, has a different copyright status from the rest of the archive, or to note if we've been given the rights to reproduce something which is otherwise under copyright. Thirdly, it's another way to acknowledge the archives that we collaborate with and which have kindly given us permission to use images of their collections. The final field is the transcription field. This will not be entered into the spreadsheet, only into Quill directly. And you may want to go through and add them after you've uploaded the items, it's up to you. It will be a rich text field, so you'll be able to replicate any intentional formatting found in the original document. I'm sure you already know this already, but just to reiterate that intentional formatting for us means that you should not include arbitrary things like line breaks or page numbers, but that you should include things like underlinings, use of bold, italics, etc. Make sure to copy the text of the document exactly, including any grammatical errors or typos that are present in the original. If you're using an OCR, you need to proofread the text of its output really, really carefully. And it's important that you do so at this stage when you're entering the transcription into Quill. Once the text starts getting copied and pasted into different bits of Quill, the number of times you have to correct any mistakes will multiply really quickly. And as you will know, once any error becomes part of the document text in Quill, it's very complicated and a painstaking process to correct it. So yeah, this is the point to proofread. And then once you have the transcription safely in Quill, you can copy and paste from the transcription field to modeler session, like Ruth was saying earlier, instead of from a Word document. And we hope that this will reduce the number of formatting errors that get introduced by that kind of invisible formatting that Word adds to things.